Well, I'm Gary Shapiro, and I'm president and CEO of the Consumer Electronics Association. That's a national trade association of over 2,000 technology companies. And we're best known for owning and producing the international CES, which is actually the world's largest innovation event. How many of you have heard of international CES? How many of you been there? Oh, real credit. All right, there you go. At least four, five of you I know of. Um, it's in Las Vegas every January. Over 150,000 people. It's a business event. There's over 3,000 exhibitors, over 5,000 media, over 35,000 people. There's no test here, by the way. I don't know why you're writing notes, but you're welcome to. Over 35,000 people from outside the United States. And it's, the purpose of the event is to get people together. Now, some may think it's strange that here I am representing technology companies who really are progressing towards the point where you don't have to get together physically. And yet, I'm excited about people getting together physically in a live interactive marketing event. I um, took the job in part because I went to my first CES. I was a consultant to the association. And I fell in love with it because I saw there the marketplace in action. I saw companies positioning themselves as they wanted the world to see them, right next to their competitors. And when you get 3,000 of them in one room, it's very, very exciting. A live interactive marketing event, you're using your five senses. You're seeing, tasting, touching, smelling. You're, you're evaluating not only somebody's products, technologies, and services, but them as people. So you get to shake their hand, look them in the eye, and figure out whether or not you can do business. We were talking earlier at dinner tonight about the challenge I think we're facing in Washington, D.C. is there's not enough of that going on. People, the parties, are not establishing relationships with each other, so they're not doing the business we pay them to do, which is a challenge we're, we're facing and suffering from as a country. So that event uh, has grown remarkably over the years. It's the largest event by any definition in the United States, if not the world. It's 1.9 million net square feet of exhibit space. That means we don't even count the aisles. And it also uh, produces a phenomenal amount of media coverage. It's considered the most coveted speaking slot for a CEO. It's in the top 10 of every list, but it's the only one that's a trade show. And we have, we've had Bill Gates repeatedly year after year until we didn't. Um, and then we had Steve Ballmer, who took his place. And then we decided it was time to move on. And uh, that slot went to the CEO of Qualcomm, a company I urge you to pay attention to because he knocked the socks off everyone. But we also have car companies now. We have motion picture companies, Hollywood, broadcasters, cable industry, Madison Avenue. Basically, the world has figured out that if they want to do business in this new technology age, they have to understand where the products are, where they're coming from, and what the future is. So part of what, that's part of what we do as a trade association in Washington. We also do a tremendous amount of market research how many widgets are sold each year, what the trends are, what consumers like. All our market research is on a database going back many, many years, and it's searchable by demographics, by product, by feature, uh, whatever. So we do it by sales volume, unit volume, and also what consumers want. And we do public policy as well. So we're very focused on what is important in terms of innovation and what's important for the future of the consumer technology industry. Um, well, something happened remarkable a few years ago is that because we're an organization, like every organization, we have a governance board. And in our case, they're nonprofit and they're volunteers, just like at the University of Maryland. There's a board, and it's not paid to be there. And at a board meeting uh, several years ago, I asked our board, let's put aside the agenda for a second. What's really important to the future of innovation in the consumer technology industry in the United States? Not tomorrow, not next year, not three years from now, but in 5, 10, 15 years. And since we're a US-based association, everyone gave the same answer. It's the US economy. How well will the US economy be doing in 5 to 10 years? So I said, well, if that's what's important, how well will we be doing? And everybody said, terrible. So then the question was, why? And the answer came back is that our government is not really paying attention to the amount of money they're spending, the commitments they're making to ourselves, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, all these entitlements, all the defense spending, all the other programs, and it's spiraling out of control in a way that no one in Washington is incentivized to pay attention to. So 
when we're in such a horrible financial predicament as we are, and we were then, only it's gotten worse, you have three choices as a nation, and there's only three. And they're not mutually exclusive. You could do all three, you could do one, but if you do none, you're in trouble. You can raise taxes. That's what Democrats want to do. That's what Republicans don't want to do. You can cut spending. That's what Republicans want to do. That's what Democrats don't want to do. And the third choice is you can grow the economy. If you have a growing economy, you have higher tax revenue, you have more, um, fewer people unemployed, fewer transfer payments going out, everyone is happy. So growth is very important. And we decided that what we would do is we'd focus on growth. Because growth only comes from one thing, really, and that is innovation. And innovation, it actually could also come from exports, but putting exports aside, and it's a good idea to promote exports. But innovation, um, a lot of people spend a lot of time debating what innovation is. I had the privilege uh, two weeks ago of being the only civilian in a room of the top people, 30, 35 people from the Customs and Border Patrol. And they spent a lot of time debating what innovation was. And I realized that my definition of innovation doesn't really work in government, but my definition is doing something different that people will pay for. So in government, though, it could be a process. So I substituted the word value, and they were all very excited and happy with that. And then we talked about innovation and what it is and how to get there. So how do you, if you're a nation, if you're the President of the United States or a member of Congress, what can you do to encourage innovation? And uh, that was the whole subject of my first book called the Comeback, How Innovation Will Restore the American Dream. I had a forward by Mark Cuban, who's a, a great friend. I worked with him on the development of HDTV many years ago. Uh, and what it came down to is the way you encourage innovation from a government point of view and policy is first you want the smartest people in the world. How many of you here were not born in the United States by a show of hands? That's great. Thank you for coming here. We want you to come here. We want you to graduate. We want you to stay here. At least I do. Because I think if you look at the United States and who we are and what we do, we are the most innovative country in the world. And the reason is multifold. First, we're an immigrant culture. We are more heterogeneous than any country in the world. In fact, that diversity that, that marks the US is great because it comes with different points of view and different ideas and allows a hallway of thinking which doesn't exist in any other country. I've, dealt, I've been around the world talking to different governments and people, and boy, you know, it's homogeneous. They have one race, one religion, one culture, they agree. We fight a lot over social issues in part because we're a diverse culture with different points of view, and that in some ways is a negative because we're spending so much time disagreeing. But when it comes time to innovation, it's because we're heterogeneous. It's because most of us came, are, are here through relatives or directly that came here because we wanted a better life. It's, we also have a culture that, that actually we do share. And the culture is we may not be great at rote learning, we not, may not get the best scores on how we do in science and math because we're not great at memorizing things. But what we're better at than any other culture is asking questions. And we're trained from the very beginning. And it's so important that I've spent a lot of time in China. I've talked to China officials. Chinese people increasingly, in fact, there's 160,000 students from China today in the United States studying. And they're getting younger and younger and younger because the Chinese government officials have figured it out that we're innovative, more innovative, and they want to be like us. Now, they've set a goal. I think it's 2.4 patents per 10,000 people. It's very difficult to measure innovation, but patents is often used because there's not much other ways of measuring it. Um, and that's part of their 10-year plan is this patent goal. And they're getting young because they want younger people here to learn about how it is that we're innovative. We also have a culture that encourages risk-taking. Not only through the economic rewards we're allowed to keep, but through the fact that failure here when you start a business is not dishonorable the way it is in other cultures. In the United States, we're actually, you start with a lemonade stand, and that's a good thing, and you try other things, and in Silicon Valley and in many other pockets of innovation around the world, including here in Maryland, innovation is something where you try, you try, you try, and then you succeed. And if you think about your own life, whether it's in school or your personal life. Think of some of the worst things that have happened to you where you were involved, you said something to someone, or you had a bad relationship. 
That is when you are learning. And that's a very valuable thing. So every time I fail, which is quite frequently, as some of our employees here will tell you, I always ask the question of, of myself or our employees or even in my fam with my family, what did we learn from that? How do we go forward? Stop less assigning blame and let's say, what is the lesson we can all take away from that and move forward? Because everything painful is a good learning experience. So the US is unique in so many different ways. We also have a great constitution, a First Amendment. And the First Amendment says the government basically cannot um, shut you down because you disagree with them publicly. And the reason that's important for innovation is because, by definition, innovation is doing something different. And if you're successful in business innovation, that means what you're doing probably is going to affect someone else's business. You're going to take market share away from someone who's existing. And you can think about it. Look, the car came along, and the car took away from all those horses and the buggy makers and things like that. And I, thousands of examples have come along since then and even before then, where a new business supplants an old one. So we have this process of creative destruction whereby we're coming up with something new. But what happens in every government around the world is the old business guys, they do everything they can to stop the new businesses from coming in, including using the government. Um, there's a, how many of you are familiar with it? Uber? OK, not that many. Uber is a, uh, it's, it's probably more common in the business world, but it's basically, you have a choice of getting around. You can walk, bike, take a cab, run, drive. If you're really lucky, you can take a limo. If you're super lucky, you have your own plane. Um, but Uber is, is increasingly used in Washington, D.C. by a lot of businesses. Basically, if you don't want to take a, a smelly, unair-conditioned taxi and you're wearing a suit like this, you call Uber. And the choice is a taxi, which is very difficult in the summertime, or a limousine with a three-hour minimum may cost like four or $500. What you can do Uber is they use spare limousine drivers basically with time in their hands just waiting, and they'll go pick you up, and they'll tell you on your, on your smartphone within seconds how soon they'll pick you up, and there's no cash that's based on your credit card. It's a wonderful service, bottom line. But anyway, the taxi cab commissions in some, including D.C., Philadelphia, and New York, have fought it because so, they, they think it interferes with taxi. Meanwhile, every user of it loves it. The DC City Council, when they tried to shut it down, got 5,000 contacts within less than 24 hours. And so they didn't shut it down. But I could give you plenty of examples of new businesses, new business models, especially enabled by the web, coming in, increases in technology, and there's an old business model trying to, to smash it and stop it down and, and stop it. So what we try to do is we try to make sure there is a way and we try to serve as the voice often of making sure a new business model can engage. And it's very difficult because this covers so many different ranges of activity. But the US generally is very, very favorable compared to other countries allowing new business models to come. And you compare it to France, for example. I'm hoping not insulting anyone here. But the French government is very good at trying to build a wall around themselves, um, protect the French language, not allow French, anything but French movies to be shown or French music to be played on the radio. And they're always trying to protect the France. And that hurts them greatly. And there's a history of that throughout the world of different countries using different means and hurting uh, entrepreneurial behavior in the country. So bottom line of it is, and I could spend a lot of time in this, is that from a government perspective, it's different. Now, from a company perspective, what does it take? So I, uh, it's a little cute, but there's this book called Ninja Innovation, and it's based on three things. One, I'm a black belt in Taekwondo. Uh, I studied karate with my family and when my sons were four and five years old. And it's something which um, I, you learn discipline, and discipline is very important. Those of you that are in, know about this may know that it is actually a Korean art form, and ninjas were actually Japanese warriors. This is marketing, we call it. So we use the word ninja because ninja in one word describes what I view as a way of life and a way of thinking. Ninjas were Japanese warriors, which against great odds, they were always smaller, they were always outmanned, and they were almost always victorious because they thought outside the box, because they communicated well, they built up great teams, they were quick and they were fast and they responded to the, the situation. And with my sons, and with my employees, if you want to get ahead, and this is a matter of personal career advice for those of you that are starting out, the way you get ahead in an organization and the way you succeed is you solve problems. You don't create them for your supervisors. So 
we had a problem at our um, office with our trade show that Ali Freed solved and made us several hundred thousand dollars. And that was, we had press conferences and they were back to back and they were crowded and people were taking advantage of them. So Ali had the idea, why don't we move to a new location and why don't we start charging money for it? And, all of a, and she made it happen and the whole thing worked and that's why she heard she's doing so well. But the point is she had an idea. She acted on it, she executed it. I'm exaggerating just a tiny bit, but it was great. So the bottom line of it is, is that if you, there's a Harvard Business Review article written in the, um, the 60s about monkey on the back. Who's, are you going to your boss and putting a monkey on their back or are you taking it off? What I tell our employees, if you hit a brick wall, you don't come back and say, I hit a brick wall. You figure out how to break down that wall, go around it, get under it, you know, parachute in, go into a third world parallel universe, but you figure out the solution. And that's a good way of approaching life, is solve the problem and be creative. There's never just a yes or no answer. There's always a third way of doing things. And I urge you to come up with a third way. The challenge is, and I was meeting this morning with a, uh, the, an officer of a multinational company. And I said, you know, we want to do some things. And he says, well, I couldn't do that. That would take me six months to get approval from Japan. And I, and I just, like, I walked out of there with my colleague and he said, boy, I'd sell their company stock short. Because when you're dealing with a very large company, an entrepreneur will have an advantage in a market. Because very large companies, they find it very, very difficult to move quickly, almost impossible, unless there's an extraordinary CEO like a Steve Jobs or someone else who could assess the situation, cut through layers, make a decision. But large companies are really easy to compete with. They have higher cost structures. They, they leave huge niches open because it's not profitable for them. And they can't make decisions quickly. A ninja can make decisions quickly and respond quickly and do things. And that's very important. Creating a team. Now, the natural human tendency of creating a team is that you want a team of people just like you that will agree with you, which is the dumbest thing you could do in business, frankly. You know, the way it works, and I've been guilty of this, is you, as you go up the management ladder, you, you have to go through this employee review process. And you get your employees in and you tell them what the weaknesses are. You ask them to work on their weaknesses. And, and then you do the same thing next year. And you have to, the truth is everyone in the world has weaknesses. Every employee, every supervisor, and you just have to know what they are. And then you work around them. You hire people that work around your weaknesses. You hire people that are different. You hire people that, that can push back and present a different way and push back on an idea if they disagree with you. So you want to hire confident people that are different than you. And there's this great myth in America that entrepreneurs do things by themselves. And you look at Thomas Edison or Bill Gates or Steve Jobs, how they created their company. If you dig just a, you know, a tiny bit deeper, you'll see that there was a team of people, of very complementary people. In fact, I've noticed, uh, because I've dealt with hundreds of these companies, is sometimes it's, it's almost a, you, you get the outside person who's focusing on sales and marketing and great relationships, and you get the inside person often who's really great at the engineering, the production, the software development, the creation, and then there's teams that, that surround in other ways, whether it's accounting or, or uh, management structures or distribution. And there's a team of people, each with different expertise, different personality, but they do share uh, a passion for the mission and the ability to work together. Another common mistake that companies, big companies make, and it's, it's almost, they get involved in groupthink. And they all agree with each other, and they convince themselves that their way is the right way. And I had an experience with a company, I was in Japan a few years ago, and talking to a company, and they thought this product, which was, I think, a DVD recorder, that's what it was. And they had the, they, should, they said, we're going to be introducing this, this is going to have, you know, millions of sales, and here's our chart, and here's our growth, and all the, the entire management team of this multi-billion dollar company was shaking their heads yes, and I said, who would want that? I said, I don't think that's going to be a, a great seller. Um, and I, I turned out to be right. Um, I'm not sure how far this will get, but uh, I was, there was a product which came along called 3D television. And uh, although I am the head of the Consumer Electronics Association and the paid cheerleader for the industry, and I tried, I couldn't get myself that excited to say this is the best thing since sliced bread. Ali's going to kill me on this one, I know. But the bottom, so I was quoted in the Wall Street Journal saying it's a wonderful feature that's been overhyped. And I got in a lot of trouble for it, but, and that was over two years ago. But again, it's a great feature, but it is not the next best thing since sliced bread. 
for a lot of many, many different reasons, some of which are obvious, and I'm happy to expound upon which people care. But there are a few products coming along which are the best products in sliced bread. And if anyone wants to ask, I'll talk about them later. Um, the other thing about uh, focusing on entrepreneurship and being a ninja and competing is our, our silver concept. So it's, it's the teamwork and it's the ability to act quickly, which I, as I indicated, is not something. As there's a statement in, in the, the people always talk about their own defense department that the entire war plan changes with engagement with the enemy. And so you could have a great strategic plan. You could have a great business plan. But the second you go out into the marketplace, it changes. Uh, I was at uh, South by Southwest this weekend and returned last night. And yesterday I was judging entrepreneurs, and um, they were going through this process called, help me out here. What was it? Business Canvas, Business Canvas which I'm sure all of you know about, and I don't, but I learned about it fairly quickly. And they spent 48 hours redoing their, all their business plans, well, I guess their Canvas, and talking to customers, and they all changed their ideas uh, rather quickly before they invested, which was, they actually talked to customers and got feedback, which was a very, very positive thing. Um, and they presented and we gave winners and advice and things like that. But the reality is they were able to do that before they invested the money, which was a good thing. And I was amazed at how wrong and obviously wrong so many of them were, even with the business canvas, frankly. And my standard criteria is would I want to personally invest in the companies? And out of the 10, I, I thought one had a great idea, which I guess would be wrong to expose here because then all you would adopt it. <laughs> but so. The focus of um, Ninja Innovation is really, uh, it, it's a book about having spent time with Bill Gates and a, a lot of other CEOs and say, this is what I've observed. Here's the mistakes that they've made that I've seen, and here's the mistakes I've made. And in fact, the penultimate, uh, the ultimate rather chapter of the book is really focused on our own trade show and the mistakes we made and the things that were really minor, which turned out to be huge in terms of changing how that event became a world dominant event. Uh, I don't want to keep talking and not leave time for my favorite spot, which is questions and answers. So is that okay now? Okay, so if you have a question, uh, the way we do this with my staff is the first person who asks a question gets to go on a pizza line first. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? How would you convince a team that's stuck in groupthink to accept innovation? Um, that's a great question. How do you convince a team that is, that is believing their own um, idea that's clearly wrong to, to change, or, right? To change and do something differently? Well, oftentimes the marketplace will do that. So a really interesting example that's, that's come up recently is, is um, this, we were talking about it earlier, and it's been talked about everywhere in the last week, is this, the head of Yahoo, uh, a woman, and I think she's a fourth or fifth CEO in the last several years, changed the policy that people could work at home, which is a big, big deal, by the way, when you're in the workforce. Is it, you know, working at home, you, you have kids, you want to work around, you want to be flexible, and you built your life around, and all of a sudden, some of the CEO comes in, I'm no longer letting you do that. Um, well, the reality is, is that Yahoo's had some serious issues. I mean, and they shouldn't be, but they need a new direction. So she, as a CEO, has to change the direction of the company, or there will be a new company, or as someone here joked, they'll all be teleworking soon. So I think you have to, and I try to do this, as the employees here of CEA know, is that a good leader is one that can not only inspire passion for the mission, but can also, I think, make it clear that if you don't do your job or contribute to the group effort, the organization itself will not survive. Um, one of the challenges that, that we face, or let's say in government, is you're guaranteed a job in government almost no matter what you do. In the private sector, that's not the case. You'll be out of a job if the organization does not survive. The reason that you, someone told me from Europe recently, I, I haven't had a chance to check if this is true, that the United States in the last almost every year since World War II, has created more companies than Europe has since World War II. In my view, one of the reasons is that Europe is fossilized and it's very difficult to hire and fire someone in Europe. If you hire them, you must keep them for life in some countries or pay a huge, huge fee. 
So companies are not encouraged to hire people, and going out of business or changing or reducing is, is, is well, you have to go out of business. So there's very little risk taking that's gone on in Europe, in Europe and as indicated by their growth. In the U.S., that's not the case. I mean, there are efforts to change the law and say you must hire someone and give them certain advantages, and there's always efforts. There's a tension between what some people want in terms of workers' rights versus what companies want, which is flexibility. So the ultimate threat is you'll be out of a job, but you have to somehow convince people and open it up. Now, what we do is we, have a, we use a lot of brainstorming techniques in our office, and, and most of our employees are very well versed in how to participate in a meeting, how to brainstorm. There's nothing, you know, there's no bad ideas. We have all sorts of ways of evaluating ideas in a group way which is not threatening to the creator of the idea, whether it's the sticky dot method or the tally method or by hands or whatever. I mean, there's all sorts of ways that you should learn about coming, dealing with a group and coming to agreement. That's why I think some of the um, MBA classes that focus on group dynamics and coming up with group projects are really much more valuable in the real world than some of the things you might learn from a textbook, uh, personally. I don't know if that answered your question, but it's probably the best I could do. Because when I'm when we're the CEO, I'll tell you, it's really easy. <laughs> you just say, you have to go in a different direction or this isn't going to work. And eventually, you just pull out your CEO card and say, I, uh, the decision rests with me on this one. I mean, the challenge, honestly, as a CEO is that you want people to fail to learn. And you have to see, but when you know the wrongs, it, it's very difficult. It's like with a kid, even. I mean, one of the challenges I see in American culture is that we used to you know, have, be competitive, and everyone would compete, and there'd be winners and losers. Parents are so re reluctant to let their kids fail that, that you know, sometimes they don't keep score, everyone gets a trophy, you try to interject yourself in your kid's life and so they, they never get any pain. But there's research which actually shows that's a really bad thing. You grow up with kids, you end up with kids that are dependent upon the parents, they're not confident, they can't make decisions, they, can't, they don't even evaluate things correctly from a moral or, or drinking or drugs point of view. If kids or parents are always interjected, it's the same thing in business. You, you have to let people fail. I'm really big on failure is the best thing that could ever happen to you, in case you hadn't noticed that. We have a question over here in the front. Well, in terms of the future, so here's some great things that are definitely happening in technology. So uh, ultra high definition television. It's four times the, um, the resolution of existing television and, and increasingly people are getting these big screens and they're incredibly cheap. Well, you can see the pixels and that's something which is real and will happen in the next few years. Um, HDTV was certainly such a big change HGTV is, we used to define it by, has three things. 16 by 9 aspect ratio, which means it's, it's more horizontal like a real movie theater. It has um, 35 millimeter resolution, which probably means nothing to most of the people in this room. And digital Dolby surround sound. But I, I was so passionate about HGTV, and, sp and I, I talk about it in my book. It, it spent a lot of my career on it, at, at moving us as a nation to HGTV, that I, when I die, my tombstone will be 16 by 9 aspect ratio. <laughs> So the second thing is, um, uh, well, there's, there's so many. There's, I'm not going to limit it to three. Uh, certainly uh, nanotechnology, robotics, machine-to-machine uh, -machine telecommunications, and the, the Internet of Things, if you will. Uh, telemedicine is absolutely huge. Haptics, which is, you know, sensing moving, things like that. Uh, and, and the driverless car. Um, and it just... Think about the driverless car for a second. So we're, we're moving there quickly. Right now, how many of you are driven a car that makes the beep beep sound with a camera when you've backed up? Uh, not that many of you. Wow, shocking. Um, well, once you drive that, and if you drive for a while, you like start hitting things if you're not driving that car because you get used to it. But now there's quickly, there's collision avoidance systems being built into cars that will, will sense other cars. And the next step then is driverless cars, which at least three companies have already demonstrated are feasible. So driverless cars, you want to talk about dislocating society. All the, all the people, the cab drivers and the truck drivers and, the, and all the people who, who like to drink and then they don't want to drive. I mean, it's going to be all disabled people will be empowered. I mean, the, the fundamental change, insurance companies, body shops, ambulance, ambulance uh, uh, hospital emergency rooms that are dealing with it. I mean, there's a whole world of the economy built around people getting hurt which will be drastically reduced, actually. So to me, that's very, very exciting. And it's an absolute certainty that it will occur. 
but there are policy implications, and it's going to be a, a rocky road to get there. Yes, we have a question back here. Um, what are your thoughts on 3D printing and its oh, implications thank for the you. future? <laughs> 3D printing was one of my, the, 3D printing is huge. So 3D printing, for those of you who don't know, is the ability to basically take a, a printer in your home, and it's more than a printer, you could put, and you will be able to put almost anything into it. Like right now, the cheap ones, you basically have a cheap plastic compound, and you could, with a software program, and there's literally hundreds of thousands of open software programs available today. And you could buy one of these printers for a couple thousand dollars, and you could create something. I mean, the controversy is you can create a gun, but you could also create a button that you've lost. You could create spare parts, which are absolutely huge. Uh, you could create almost anything. And then as we progress beyond the plastics into the metals, into the bio stuff, you know, creating organs and skin, creating a gourmet dinner, why not? If you could have the food put in and it could do it for you. So it's just a question of we're learning so much about the things that go in there. But it, lays, it raises a lot of public policy questions um, that are rather interesting. But I think 3D printing is absolutely huge, major game change. And I'm really glad you brought it up because it's actually one of my top three. And I just forgot. We have a question right here. Building on that thought, right, as you look back to some of the new innovations uh, within CEA, where is it that the technology actually met up with societal pressures to stave the technology from happening, to stop the diffusion from happening? Maybe as it related to policy, maybe as it related to social and ethical issues. Um, so how much do you see that playing as a role in terms of stopping technological progress? That's a great question. Um, well, how many are familiar with SOPA PIPA? Many of you. So SOPA PIPA was legislation that was, went through the Senate Judiciary Committee unanimously uh, a year and a half ago, which would have basically allowed anyone who's a content owner, which is everyone in the United States, because the truth is you all own copyrights. You just don't know it. Anytime you've created anything original under international treaties we've signed, you actually own the copyright in it would allow you to shut down almost any website if you claim they were using your product. So our concern, and we were screaming about it, was this would basically shut down you know, smaller companies, things like that, um, and, and hurt innovation. And the public finally reacted as we had a blackout day that people responded to. And 5 million people contacted Congress within 24 hours. And 30 members of Congress took their name off the legislation. In fact, SOPA PIPA will never be used again for legislation in my lifetime. It's kind of like naming your kid Adolf. No one does it anymore. You know, it's not a very popular name. So that was one example of, of we came close. Another example, which no one really wants to talk about because it's, it's so politically incorrect, and that is um, when there was a Democratic Congress and a Democratic president uh, four years ago, there was legislation rushing through Congress which would have required that every product be usable by everyone with any disability if it was hooked up to the internet in any way, telecommunications. And I just went crazy when I heard this, but we couldn't stop it because no one ever wants to agree with the dis disabled community. It's just it's impossible, frankly. Even the Republicans were scared because, oh, we don't want to vote against disabled people that are with disabilities. And it seems so logical. They said, well, do you understand that you cannot produce a product which is usable by a person who can't hold things and a person who is blind who may need bigger I mean, it, it, it was just crazy. And I testified before Congress. I was the only one opposing it. And I got beat up. It's an interesting YouTube video if you want to watch it. Um, <laughs> but we did manage to get it changed dramatically. But it's still out there. And they're fighting the same battles now at the FCC that are coming up. And it's very, very difficult. I, I wrote an op-ed in the Washington Times, which was headlined. Um, Democrats won. I didn't, you know, by the way, what I've learned through this is you don't write the headlines when you are um, writing an op-ed. The newspaper does. And the Washington Times um, wrote the headline that said, Democrats want to design your iPhone. And uh, Speaker Pelosi got very upset with that. And right before I was about to testify, I got word that she was really angry at me, um, but, which caused the Democrats to attack me. But the bottom line of it was that almost went through but we, managed, we couldn't stop it, and now it's there. It is restricting innovation without question, but it's also enhancing innovation in some ways because people have to think about these things now. So any other questions? Two back there. 
very efficient use of the microphone. You said that you're pretty big on failure and um, learning from your mistakes, so I was wondering if you'd be willing to share what your biggest failure was and what you took from that. I'll, I'll restrict that to business issues, if yeah, I can. Yeah, of course. <laughs> so, um, one of my embarrassing mistakes was I, I, I really pride myself on, on when new technology is introduced, I think I know whether it's going to succeed or fail. I'm, like At least every week someone presents to me a business idea and off, more often than not, it requires on some government action, which is never going to happen. And they think they have, if everyone else just builds their product this way, I could solve this problem. Well, everyone else is not going to build their product that way. But I think I'm good at it still. And I, I, I do have a good success rate, but I'm not perfect. So uh, early on when Bill Gates was, um, was just starting out and was, he was speaking at our show, as he did every year, I think the second or third time, he came in and they locked off the room. And it was just Microsoft people and me, and he was rehearsing. And I had, you know, I had some ideas about his presentation and how we should change, and I was really excited about the product he was introducing. And I talked to some of his people, and they got very, very nervous about my suggestion. They said, you better tell Bill directly. <laughs> so you know, I, I, went to tell you, I didn't think it was a big deal. And I gave him some advice about how we should present. And I'm pretty confident in that, because I observe a lot of presentations. I give a lot. Um, I have some ideas about it. And he's very receptive to them. And then I said something really stupid that I shouldn't have had, and I, I'm embarrassed to even present it today. And then I, I said, is this product you're introducing that, I, that you, you know, I saw you, I think it's going to be one of the best products ever introduced at the international CES. Well, the product was the dancing paperclip called Bob, <laughs> which is one of the most, proved to be one of the biggest failures and most annoying products in history. <laughs> Those of you over a certain age might recall, you couldn't remove it from your computer, and it, it, thought, it was just terrible. But one of the lessons from that was what I didn't know and I learned later, and the reason his staff was so nervous, is Bill Gates was single then. But he was dating Melinda, uh, a woman in his office, and it was her idea. No one wanted to say anything to him. And that was... There was a lesson there, you know, the lesson for me was I, I should, you know, maybe not always give advice to Bill Gates, because I'm sure he, you know, he knows who I am, but I don't think he values my advice that much anymore. Um, but no one wanted to say anything within Microsoft to Bill Gates, in my view, because, you know, hey, it's the boss's girlfriend, it's her idea, it's her project. So the lesson there is, you know, this goes to your question earlier about what do you do when people are agreeing. Well, maybe you should ask why they're all agreeing. If you have a boss that doesn't want to be told he's wrong, or there's a relationship in the office, which is why some of these rules that have evolved since then about dating people in your office, which didn't exist at the time, are really actually kind of important rules about relationships in the business environment. Um, talking about technology and innovation, what are your thoughts on uh, Google Glasses or Google Car? especially the efficiency and productivity is going to bring in, and are you going to buy one when it comes out? <laughs> uh, yes. I, you know, I, you know the, the glass, I am, I spent, I've met Bill Clinton a few times, and I was always amazed that he remember people's names and relate to them. Um, the reason I really love my job is in part because it's the most exciting industry in the world, and I'm doing great things and making a difference in public policy and changing the world. But the real reason is the, the trade show. You have to wear a badge with someone's name on it. I love that because I'm not great at memorizing people's names and it's, uh, so badging is very important. And in fact, Google Glasses and things like that which allow you to give you input about who's around you. And there's, just at South by Southwest, I heard so many really great ideas for linking up with people around you, software applications uh, that are being introduced. Um, so I'm pretty excited. Now whether Google Glasses will be the ultimate one or be something else, I mean, you know, usually, even if you think about the uh, Apple products, they're not the first. Apple wasn't the first in any of their three categories, of the, at least I'm aware of. Arguably the smartphone, maybe the iPhone. But definitely not the iPod. I mean, they were, that was like a third or fourth generation product. There was plenty of companies that had MP3 players. They just managed to present it well and integrate with software nicer. The iPad, you know, Microsoft and others had tablets. We'd been arguing for years saying there's this huge TV that's, that's a market. There's a small. Uh, phone, which is a market, but there's a middle size, which is up for grabs. 
And but they were there. There was Microsoft was there too early. We had, we created a show called the Person Computing and Communication Show. The Newton was shown there. There was a lot of products there. So the bottom line is, it's not only about being having the right product. It's having it at the right time, which is true in a lot of business ideas. Timing is as most, much important as almost anything. And obviously, the user interface is very important. So I think whether it's Google Glasses or something else, or whether it's Google Smart Car or someone else's, you know, the, the great thing is people just keep coming up with better things until they hit. And sometimes they don't hit at all. I don't know if that answered your question, but it was, yes, I will buy when it's the right price for me. And yeah, a question back there with the man with the tie. Uh, you talked to, earlier about uh, enjoying seeing the, the market, if you will, just very close together and competing. I'm curious if, in the context of these uh, of the trade shows, if you've ever seen collaboration come out, maybe between competitors that has produced something bigger than what competition would have produced. Oh, uh, collaboration is very, very important. If you read one book, I'd recommend it's called Co-Opetition, if you're in a business environment. Co-Opetition is, is my byword. Like, the, I didn't build up the international CES, and, and uh, we made some good decisions, and the staff did. But what we've really done is we've gone out to like over 100 other organizations, and we've partnered. Some of them are competitive associations. Some of them are publications. Some of them are just entrepreneurs with an idea. So we, we partner our way to success always. And I think any successful company has partnered their way to success. Collaboration, and even it's the chance meeting, because it's difficult to plan collaborations and how you meet people and develop that trust and relationship. But especially now, where like the average smartphone has like 10,000 different patented components in there, you have to cross-license. You have to figure out what it is you're good at before you make your business decision, and you must partner with others. That's why one of the great core strengths I think every business student must have is the ability to form relationships with others and work cooperatively. And that's something that, that you know, we're good at. Americans are good at that. And it's, I go back to the cultural thing, is that in other societies, you can't disagree. There's sometimes societies have no words for no. We are more honest and frank by our culture with each other which sometimes causes violent disagreement, but more often it causes a more honest relationship. We say things to each other that cultures don't, other cultures you don't say to each other, which allows us to be more honest and progress, and that's an important part of having a strategic partnership. One of the most significant talks I heard in my life was somebody talking about strategic partnerships. I am totally there uh, on that. And a lot of it is, I hate to say it, some of it is just random. I hear about this, our exhibitors of the show all the time. You know, they've met someone just randomly coming by their booth, and they have a relationship, and they built something. And, and part of what we do as an association, frankly, is get people together. It's in our events we do. It's in what we say. It's what we write. That's an important part of it. I see a question over here. Austin. You want to give Austin a microphone? Uh, to what extent do you think uh, the, audio, the auto industry has it impacted your show? Uh, the question is about the auto industry impacting our show. We had uh, eight of the ten largest car companies there. That was a strategy we employed. Look, we determined a long time ago that the number of people that mattered were retail buyers like Best Buy and Walmart and Target that came to our show, which is what the show is built on. The important 90% of the market share would be fit, could fit in a room one-tenth the size. So we said, if we're going to grow as a show, we have to do two things. We have to expand the audience of the people coming to the financial community, the international community, to um, in, investors, buyers, sellers, journalists. Uh, from around the world, and we had to also include the scope of what we define as consumer electronics. So our strategy was to redefine consumer electronics. So, the, so we went after Hollywood, the broadcasters, and others, and we went after the auto industry. And now at the same time, you know, the auto industry is facing some challenges. And there's this, the auto industry was very incestuous and very slow moving, honestly. Uh, it takes like four or five years to make a change in a car. It was, it was less than a year for a change in our industry. The two industries diametrically opposed view of life. Ford was dying, and the Ford Board of Directors did something incredibly smart. They did something unthinkable in the auto industry, and that is they hired someone from outside the industry. They thought outside the box. They came up with a new solution. They hired the guy who ran Boeing, or was the number two guy. He didn't get the top Boeing job. Alan Mulally of Boeing. And he came in, it was, it was terrible. And he basically, he has redefined Ford, not only by breaking down the spires within the large company of Ford and making everyone come to me on Saturday and rewarding them for communicating to each other, but he also redefined the car. So instead of a car being bought on the basis of horsepower and zero to 60, 
It's being bought on the basis, as we were arguing it was, on the basis of technology. And what's in there? How much of your home you could take and put in there? And totally changed Ford. I mean, they were, the, they were the Detroit company that did not take government bailout money. They were rewarded for that by the American public, and they were rewarded because they um, really have redefined technology. Now, other companies, are, Audi's doing that. Others, everyone's doing that. Everyone wants to be at our trade show. And trust me, it's a challenge because we don't have space for them. We don't have speaking slots for them. And, and they all want to be there because the car has been redefined. Uh, we're seeing the same thing now. We're redefining the show to include digital health, uh, M health, as it's called, mobile health, wireless health. We had Dr. Sanjay Gupta and Dr. Oz at our show. Uh, but but th there's some great things going on in that area. One of the biggest problems is society worldwide and it's solvable by technology, which is really, really exciting. We have a question right here. Will you like to share one uh, opportunity which you are really ha uh, proud of through which you created innovation for a company? I I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. Can you share any example where you partnered with a company to really help them innovate? Um, well, the way we, we are like Switzerland in the sense that we can't just favor and do things for one company. So what we, we really try to avoid it. Uh, but certainly, we help companies meet other people and hook them up. So there's a company that I saw, and I'll tie it back to what I just said. Um, I was visiting Cleveland, actually, to visit a design facility there called Nottingham Spire, which is first they were so creative because basically they bought a Mormon church that was going under. And they're based in this gorgeous church. You know, you know like the church here, the Mormon church around the Beltway, which appears like Oz? Um, they had got one of those in Cleveland overlooking the city. And so you walk in, and you see this big room with a pipe organ, and it looks like a church. And uh, anyway, they, they introduced me to one company called HealthSpot. And what HealthSpot is is an ATM for um, healthcare. So basically, you go anywhere in the world. There's an internet connection. You walk into this 6 by 6 kiosk. You sit down, it measures your weight, it assesses your temperature, your blood pressure, and then it asks you your symptoms on a computer screen. You, you, know, you punch what they are, and it links you up to the appropriate doctor who then could ask other questions or unlock panels and have you tested like your eyes and your ears and, and even the screen in other ways. So basically, it allows a doctor anywhere in the world to service the appropriate patient anywhere in this kiosk. And if the kiosk is next to or in a drugstore, you can get the drugs you need right there. Um, and all it requires is a technician to come in and out and clean between the sessions to make sure it's sterile and make sure all the products are used and put back. So it's a, to me, it was a phenomenal concept. And I said, I know you don't know who I am. I know you don't know anything about the CS. But if you come to the show, I promise you, you will be featured. And people will know about you. And that's what happened. They were one of the stars of the show. I talk about it in my book. And so I, that was an example of a partnership where we, I wanted to feature something and show something which could affect the world. And you know, whether or not they succeed, it's still up to them and investors and whether people will buy it and their business model, which is an interesting model. But that's an example. Are we, um, one more. Well, I, if there's no more question, I just want to leave you with something totally different. I'm going to shift, shift subject on you. So a lot of people ask me why I do what I do. I obviously have a great job, a great career, a great family, and things like that. But I'll be very personal with you for a second. So I am 56 years old, which I know for many of you, most of you, seems like unbelievably old. And I, um, I have older kids that are in their 20s. They're doing very well. But I uh, was divorced, and I got married. Um, nine years ago, and shockingly, um, even though I know about the birds and the bees, my wife, even though she's, I'm trying to respect her privacy, she was, um, she got pregnant. And even though she was older and way beyond the age where anyone would care about that stuff or it likely happened. So that uh, pregnancy, which was five years ago, six years ago, uh, forced me to, you know, the age of 51, my wife a little bit younger, it really forced me to think about things. Because when you first, when you're your age, most of your age, you have kids, it's just part of life, you don't think about it at all. But when you get older and have children, what you start thinking about is you will not be around for most of your kid's life. 
and it forces you to be introspective. So what I did is I determined personally that there's some big challenges in our world, and they're worth, I owe these, this kid uh, to do something different and to try to change them. And uh, you know, I want to come back to what I said earlier, which is such a boring subject, but it's the deficit. We are screwing your generation totally. We are stealing from you and giving it to ourselves and making ourselves promises, and you're going to pay for it. And yet your generation has been totally, totally quiet on it. I can't point to one movement of younger people saying this is an issue. And I am shocked by that, because I know you all know math, because you're business students. Um, so you just do the math, and you figure it out soon that you're going to be a second or third tier country in a matter of years, because we can't afford to do the basic government services we have. And you know, having visited uh, Cambodia, Vietnam, India, having been inside factories all around the world in different countries, in China, and, uh, let me tell you something. It's tough out there, and the rest of the world wants what we have, and it's a competitive environment, and you're too quiet and you should be louder, and you should be speaking about it. Having said that, um, five years later, <laughs> four years later, something else happened. My wife got pregnant again. I now have a, I know. And my wife's a doctor, by the way. We went to the OBGYN, and, and she said, how could this happen? And the doctor said, you're a doctor. You know how it happens. <laughs> so, so I now have a 10-month-old child as well, and uh, two kids, and they're wonderful. But I, I am concerned, not for them personally, financially, but for the generation. Of, of what they're inheriting. And I urge you to wake up and do something about it, because you haven't. And you're letting my generation totally screw your lives, the first generation of Americans ever ruining their kids' lives. And that's my generation. And on the one hand, I'm proud of the fact that I played a major role in so many different technologies and giving you great guys great things to play with and work on. I am embarrassed for my generation that we have failed you so miserably. So do something about it. Not to leave you on a happy note, but thank you. Uh, I have an email address. I have articles. I appreciate you coming.